All right, Charleston head coach Pat Kelsey. Um, let's start off with two quick ones here. Uh, Justin Moore from Drexel banned from this program. I was at the game. I was at the game last week. He hits that buzzer beater. I was expecting, uh, you know, maybe say hello to the coach. A uh, nice little. It was happy, and then Justin Moore rips the heart out. So he is banned from this program. That's as a uh, as a justice to you, just to let you know. Yeah, man, this this has uh, been an interview that I've been looking forward to for a long time. I'm a big fan. Um, it, it, not just pumping your tires, a little starstruck to be on with you. And, uh, you know, after the interview was scheduled, we lost two games. We had won of 20 course. straight. You know, we were we were rolling and playing really, really well. And I was really worried that, that you were going to call and cancel. So I appreciate you, you sticking this deal out, man. Thanks. No, it usually goes the other way. Like, you, like that guy's a mush. I got to get rid of him. So I was expecting it the other way. Like, hey, we lost two when I, I – you've come into my orbit. You're done. And then the other one, obviously, uh, we'll have a little fun with this one. You were at Winthrop in 2020. Andy uh, Katz had you predicted as a 16 seed. Right off the bat, you would have played Gonzaga. How much would you have beaten Gonzaga by in the COVID year? <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I can make that prediction. But it, it doesn't matter. We're never going to know. So you win by 17. Let's say 17. Absolutely. All right, why fair not enough. <laughs> yeah, why, exactly. why not 18? You know, Gonzaga is kind of the poster child, if you will, for, for mid-majors. And they're not a mid-major anymore. We all know that. But they're the poster child in the, in the barometer, right? In the benchmark for what we're all trying to do. We said that when we got the job here and, and at the press conference and in the interview, the president talked about it, our athletic director. And we tell anybody that wants to hear, we think we could become a Gonzaga of the East here. So that would be a heck of an honor to play those guys. Yeah. You talk about that. So uh, Jordan Cornette is a, I think is a friend of yours. He said you was a friend of yours. You might, I don't know if he's over. Yeah. Yeah. Right, no, right, he's right. A, he, well, they, you know, he's Cincinnati royalty. Um, we're, we're both from, uh, all boys Catholic schools in Cincinnati. I went to elder high school. He went to St. Xavier and they are bitter, bitter rivals. And um, my brother is, uh, is, is his age. So they were competitors and got to be good friends. And um, so, so yeah, we, there's a lot of GCL pride there. And, and obviously I know his stature is a college basketball figure now and, and what he's done, what he's accomplished is really, really impressive. Yeah, I mean, he talked about your energy. He was like, yeah, this guy's nuts. And I think he he said, like, you guys would get along because he knows I'm nuts, too. So yeah. um, with that energy, obviously, like, you saw this stuff going on with COVID. You got the plays drawn up for your kids um, in, the, you know, in the in the little Fisher-Price hoop. Like, all that stuff was kind of making its way. It's, what is so important, I guess, about bringing the energy or being br bringing the energy every day as a coach in a place like Charleston? <clears throat> Well, when you speak about energy, that's just something I was blessed with, Rico. Like, I have that in great supply. I say it all the time. I definitely got the short end of the stick in looks, uh, obviously hair. I'm trying to hold on for dear life, still trying to fade the sides a little bit. Uh, but up here, it's just an absolute train wreck. So intelligence, short end of the stick, all that. But I'm telling you right now, man, I got a bunch of energy and um in, in, in I'm just a big believer in being authentic and being true to who you are. And you, you mentioned uh, we're similar in that way. My mentor, Coach Prosser, who was hilarious, by the way, he he used to introduce me as, hey, this is Kels. He makes coffee nervous. And um, <laughs> it, it's just I don't have to try to be that. That's just who I am. If I tried to be Brad Stevens and be stoic on that sideline and 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 just to be – you know, he's elite special. I'd be a really bad version of him and he'd probably be a bad version of me. So that's just kind of who I am. There's a quote. I don't even know who said it. I think it was in some graduation speech somewhere and I'd have to look it up. But uh, he, he he said, be who you is and not who you ain't, because if you ain't who you is, you is who you ain't. And that makes sense to me. Not grammatically, but you're right. It does <laughs> absolutely make sense. I agree with you. But so the other thing I talked about with Jordan and, and it's obviously transferred to you down at Charleston, um, our city, right? You're out campaigning for students to go to the game. He talked about early in the day, Bray had to do that. So I guess the question is, do you think everybody can do that? Like, I understand why you have to do that, but do you think there's guys who be like, nah, I can't, I can't do that. Or does the personality match so much that it works? 
You know, like if you had an old timer or somebody trying to connect with students, like it wouldn't work. You got somebody with energy, obviously, is that's what's going on at, at Charleston. Do you think everybody would be able to do that and kind of humble themselves to be connected to that community? That's a great question. I, I think it goes back again to being authentic to yourself. It's something that uh, I enjoy doing. You know, I, I guess there's times where you you as a coach that's running a program or whatever, you feel like that's a, a must. You have to do it. It's sort of a necessary evil. And I don't see it that way. I mean, there's so, to me, I have a ball and have so much fun being on campus, high-fiving students. Um, I mean, listen, man, like I, I get to wear gear to work every day. I get to wear tennis shoes. I get to 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 be on a vibrant campus with with students or players. You know, it's just fun. It, it, it's it's fun. And that Our City slogan was something we came up with during the interview process. And I learned from the best. Skip Prosser was the best at it, the best I've ever seen. And what he was able to do when we went to Wake Forest and and um, he really wanted to connect our basketball program with the city of Winston-Salem. And, you know, if you look at the state of North Carolina, I mean, there are such a high percentage of graduates from NC State, from North Carolina. And here's Wake Forest, a little private school in Winston-Salem, kind of like smack dab in the middle of this basketball crazy state. So many Duke fans, Carolina fans, NC State fans. And his thing was, you know, we want to wake the nation, right? And by waking the nation, we had to win our backyard. He wanted to, to win sidewalk alums. There's a ton of students from Wake Forest from the Northeast. There's probably not from the city of Winston-Salem, but we wanted them to adopt that team as our team. And you give him so much credit. And just to see his ability to connect with the student body, to invigorate a campus and a city, uh, uh, it was no better training to, to learn how to do that than being around the great Skip Prosser. And I've tried, we've tried to do that everywhere we've been, whether it's at Winthrop in uh, the city of Rock Hill or here in Charleston, man. Like, I don't know if you've ever been here before. This is an extraordinary city. And I think this is one of the best jobs in the country because, uh, first of all, you have this amazing city of the Atlantic Ocean. You have the beach. You have these amazing restaurants, shops to sell. You have this gem down here in downtown Charleston, this campus that is as unique as anybody, anywhere you've ever. And then there's a tradition. John Cress built something really, really special uh, years and years ago. And it's continued with the Bobby Kremens of the world and Earl Grant did a great job here. And there's a passion and a fervor for the Cougars, man. And to see what we set out to do to start to come to fruition with us getting really good and then the city's buy-in, it's become their team. And we wanted it, the vision to be must-see TV. You can't get a ticket. And that's how it is right now. Every game sold out, game night, uh, King Street, which is one of the coolest streets in America, Rodeo Drive, Mag Magnificent Mile in Chicago. I put King Street up against any of them. It's absolutely buzzing on game night. And and it's and it's really, really cool to see. Do you think Charleston, we obviously know the, the hubs of basketball, right? The, uh, New York City, obviously, you know, playgrounds and all that stuff where I'm from. Uh, Chicago's got its history with a bunch of guys going there. Indiana, obviously, North Carolina. Is Charleston kind of under the radar of basketball? Like the people in the town, are they living and dying basketball? And we yeah. just aren't talking and, about and, it. And it was, you could see it and feel it kind of bubbling below the surface, right? And, you know, last year we took over a program. There were only two players returning from the previous roster. Like, you know, we had to build something. And, and the big thing last year was building a culture. And I think we did that. We had a winning season. And year one, you could see the excitement start to build. And then it kind of became the stars aligned in the right way in the perfect storm early on. I mean, we 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 went into North Carolina, played really, really well, came back home, uh, won the Charleston Classic, which I think is one of the best preseason November tournaments in college basketball. I mean, there's a group of them. I think the Charleston Classic's one of them. And from there, it, you, you just felt it, man. There was an explosion. Everywhere you went, people were talking about the Cougars. And um so, so yeah, heck yeah, this is a college basketball town because of what was built back in the 90s with John Cress when they were winning games in the NCAA tournament. They were ranked, and they were known as the Giant Killers. So we knew, and all I heard were stories about when Coach Cress had it rolling. 
and how downtown was buzzing and the city was engaged. And that got my heart beating fast, man. Like I, I'd stare at the ceiling at night and vision what that would be like. And for that to hit this season has been really cool. Here we are in the stretch run. We got a big, big game, big games coming up here down the stretch. And to know that I think we've created this year, one of the best environments in college basketball is, is really, really exciting. Yeah, you touched on a bunch of different things there, obviously. So the when you look at your schedule, there's a couple of different things to, to go at here. So you guys played Carolina close. Davidson, um, coach is a friend of mine. I know they're struggling, but they're obviously a great program. Virginia Tech and Kent State, who's one of the best mid-majors in the country. What did your team take away most from those games? Because obviously, and it's it's difficult with scheduling because like all those important games were played, I'm pretty sure, before Christmas. Mm -hmm. So I think your team now is way different, which is the problem with scheduling, which we don't really have to touch on. I think you should be playing non-conference games like that in Jan President's Day weekend, like especially after the Super Bowl, Martin Luther, like set it, set it up where the team in November is not the same as the team in February, but that's a whole other thing. But either way, what'd you guys take away from, from that? Because you're obviously preparing here for a run to March. You know, I just think it, it, it proved to our guys that we belonged, you know, um, you, you probably looked at our roster. It, it's a unique roster. We got guys from all over the world, from different levels of basketball, some transfers that have come in from NAIA division two. Uh, we have a core group of freshmen from last year that are all sophomores. And I think in the preseason, and in the summer as we were working, like we all had confidence that we could be really good. But I think what happened early on with some of those big wins is guys were like, we got a chance. We got a chance. And, and, and we're talented enough. OK, we're talented enough. But the special thing about this team was the selflessness, the buy in. We were playing. We we're playing 10 guys. Um, and, and, and we asked those guys to give maximum effort. And to give a fist, like Dean Smith said, and bring another fresh body in to play just as hard. It's hard to be really, really good early, really good in the middle of the season, and really good late. It's just hard in sports in general, not just college basketball. We got hit in the mouth here recently. And um, it, 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 you hate it at the time, but I think when those things happen, as long as you take those losses and that adversity, you learn from it, you realize – what you've forgotten about yourself that you need to be who you are at your core. Uh, and I think that's what those two losses allowed us to do. So we've regrouped, had a big win on the road other, uh, the other day against the talented Delaware team. And uh, we're, we're excited about, you know, this very, very important home stretch. Yeah. Chris Mooney um, from Richmond recently said, I'm pretty sure in a press conference, he was like, good luck trying to find us home and homes. So as yeah. a mid major, I think the difficulty is, a guy like you, you know, you go get a couple of big wins, you play teams tight, and all of a sudden, Pat Kelsey is 86th across the business. So, like, to me, though, it's football, a big program. It's not It's not football and basketball. You lose one game, it doesn't kill you. You lose one game as Oklahoma, Alabama, season's done. I'm not saying Duke should have a home-and-home home with you guys, but, like, you know, what are these big programs kind of hurting the product, not – scheduling some of these games, even a two and one, like what would be your solution? Cause it's obvious that as you rise up in mid majors, you're not going to play there. You saw it with Gonzaga Calipari didn't want to go play at the kennel. Like, and that's kind of the way it is in, in order for these mid major programs to get these games, you know, it's kind of, all right, well, we got to play by their rules. Like we got to go play two away and we may never get a return home game. It's just kind of how it goes. I, I guess I'm asking what kind of solution would you have with that? Because I don't think it's great for the game. Great question. Phenomenal question, actually. And I'd be lying if I said I had the answer. Um, Scheduling is easier when you first get a job and you're not great, like we weren't last year. And I think people probably looked at uh, year one and how we were building. They're like, oh, okay, we'll get those guys then. And we're better than people thought. So you're right. It's going to be very, very difficult. It was a little bit of a perfect storm because we had the Charleston Classic here on our home floor uh, and, and played some really good teams three games in a row. Um, we did play a two for one with Carolina, Carolina, you know, Matt Roberts, our AD, who's phenomenal and an unbelievable guy in terms of scheduling. I give him and Brian Cloman assistant on my staff, a ton of credit for how they built this schedule this year. And I mean, there were times when they tell me, okay, we're going to do this. What do you think about this? I'm like, man, you guys sure about that? We're you crazy. 
but they really understand the metrics. They understand the net. They understand uh, all those things. And um, so Carolina came to our place last year and I get it. I get why a high major doesn't want to do it because every piece of energy and marketing uh, 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 mental space that we have went into making that one of the best environments that's ever happened here at the College of Charleston. And it was that way. In our year one, when we had two guys returning, the place was on fire. And we had Caroline on the ropes. I mean, we're up, I think it was seven at half. And they got out of here with the wind by the skin of their teeth. And there's just not a lot for them to gain and a lot to lose when they do something like that. But you know what? I give, I give them, I give North Carolina credit for doing it. I give them credit. I mean, I think that is what college basketball is all about. Will more people do it? Will more teams do it? No, right. they won't because it's less to gain and more to lose. But, but you know, Hubert for making that decision to come here and what a, what a thing for college basketball in this city. Uh, I think that's part of it. We have a little bit of an advantage because people want to come here because it's an unbelievable place to stay. But as we've gotten better and better and better and better, it's a little bit le less like, hey, man, we're going to eat in great restaurants, and maybe pull by the beach and smell the low country a little bit. Now it's like, oh, crap, we got to go play Charleston. <laughs> so I'd love it if college basketball did that. I saw Chris Mooney's interview. I thought it was genius. He articulated it way, way, way better than I can. But um, for, for those high-level programs to make the decision to go to a Richmond or to come to a college at Charleston, I believe, makes our product better. So, you know, we're going to make the calls. We're going to call every single Power 5 team in the country to try to set up not the buy game, not, hey, pay us to come play you like, like people do to supplement their budgets. We're going to make a call to, to every Power 5 team in the country to try to set up deals, home and homes. Yeah. Uh, hopefully home and home or two for one at least. Yeah, it, like you said, I mean, I really hope these guys come through with it because it's – that's part of it. Going, it's only going to prepare you for conference play. It's only going to prepare you for the tournament. It is what it is. So, um, you talked about this year's team. The thing I've obviously noticed. I watched you a little bit and then went saw you in person the other day. Five guys in double digits. Ben Burnham off the bench with eight point four. So everybody's contributing. Is that designed, or would you much rather have the guy going for twenty five? But I guess what's the benefit of everybody being able to hit the big shot? Or hey, if you double. Um, this guy, we're going here, you know, and you kind of saw that with Burnham. I think he was the leading scorer the other night. He's sixth on the team in scoring. So if you stop one aspect of it, we got something else to hit you with. Rico, I think that a big reason we're good. At the end of the day, it's a big reason we're good. You asked, would I rather have a 25 point score? I mean, we've had those before. Uh, when we were at Winthrop, there's a five foot five kid named Keon Johnson that ended up the greatest score in the history of Winthrop basketball and didn't have any division one scholarships besides ours. And he was a monster. Um, one of the things that makes us good is our depth that we play 10 guys. Um, we have 10 guys that have started at various times throughout their career for us, or, or if they're new guys coming in, they might've been division two, all Americans. And it's hard in today's day and age to do that. Right. So it's not like by design, we say, Hey, we're going to recruit a roster. We're going to play 10 guys, but, as we got into the summer and we start seeing the gifts that our team had, and it's like, man, we're good all the way down a roster. Let's play a style with relentless rebounding, relentless pace, right? Which both takes a lot of energy. You, you got to play your butt off to be a top 10 offensive rebounding team in the country, which we are. Uh, you got you to gotta sprint maniacally every offensive possession, to be a team that people fear in transition, but both take a lot of energy. So having a group that is as selfless as ours, that buys into what we call the power of the unit, which is the uncommon commitment to the guy next to you. It's willing to give a couple points per game or a rebound or two per game for the good of us being a special college basketball team. And um, luckily for us, we have guys with the type of competitive character that are about those things. You know, it's it's almost like you read my mind. So the other thing that jumps out, you play a lot of guards, you rotate them in. And I hate to say this because, you know, it's like I'm knocking their appearance. But if we ever if we walked into a gym, they put 40 in my eye hole, as Scott Van Pelt says. So I'm not disrespecting the kids and I've watched them and they play great. But the size of these guys, 
Larson, 6'1", Smith, 6'2". Uh, I think I'm saying his name correct. Bouillon, 6'4". You said oh, Bol uh, Dalton Bolin. Bolin, Bolin, 6'4". Yep. He doesn't look – he looks six three and a half max. And, again, they all can shoot it. They all can play really well. But, again, your an offensive rebounding percentage is 16th in the country, a top 10 in offensive rebounding. So what is it about these kids that look like they walked off a geometry class and they're hanging it on people? Yeah, what I'd say, Rico, is – you know, I, I played college basketball uh, at Xavier, although I missed a thousand points by nine hundred and twelve. Um, but my mom, you got to change that. So I played for a nationally ranked high school team when the I used to say they say how you do tonight. I say, oh, me and uh, Levance combined for forty seven. Now we had <laughs> forty seven, but either way, you got to uh, you got to fix that. It's all in the spin, right? Exactly. It's all in the spin. Uh, first of all, I'm going to get you a Charleston jersey with your name on the back. So all next right. time you do one of your deals, uh, hopefully you can wave the flag of the Cougars. My mom's from South Fairmount, Cincinnati. Drive past South Fairmount. You can tell where I think I got my toughness from. And, you know, this is uh, coach speak and parent speak, whatever. But she used to say it to me all the time when people say you're too small, you're too this. It's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog. And I know that's cliche. But those guys that you just mentioned, Rico, are tough as crap. Yeah. They're nasty competitors. Dalton, Dalton Bowen, uh, um, you know, Division II All-American, had no scholarships, had a major uh, a scratch to his cornea, and he they, they were concerned he was going to go blind. He was going to have to have this major surgery, and he goes, I'm not having anything until after the season. How can I play? And they said, well, the only way you can play is to put this – patch on he played with a pirate patch on a, a, a pirate patch ryan larson leads the country in charges rain smith you know you might look at his stats and say oh he's a as skip prosser would say a suburban jump shooter rain's rain's a bulldog and and i think one of the things that uh, uh is a hallmark of our team is our tenacity our grit and our toughness and to be a top 10 rebounding team in the country and maybe not look the part. You know, Jeff Goodman was down here for a little bit, watched us play. And we were nationally ranked. And he's like, man, you guys are a really good team, but you don't look the part. That's fine. You know, but 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 we got some tough dudes. Yeah, I mean, it might even help you a little bit with that. You know what I mean? Like you're, you're looking across and you're like, or you're watching on tape. Ah, that guy's not that quick. That, and then it's just in between the lines is a different element, which I obviously saw, you know. So, like, I, you guys walked out. I'm like, man, I – you know, ranked in the country, top of the, and then sure as shit, like when the, when time is, when it's time to go, they're going. Yeah. Sure. You give so. Drexel a lot of credit last week for the game you're at, you know, uh, they were, they, they were really good made plays when they needed to. And, you know, that's the, the learning lesson for our guys is we talked about every team has a DNA, right? They have a core. What are you about? Uh, you have an it and, and, and you have to be about what you're about every game. And we sure as crap aren't going to go, out on the floor and scare people with the eye test. Uh, people aren't just going to lay down because we had a 20 game winning streak and we are nationally ranked. Uh, uh, every team, every team, in our conference has 13 scholarships and everyone has a really, really good coach and we're going to get everybody's best shot. And um, like I said, that adversity that we faced, I think will be a great learning lesson for us. Yeah. So best shot, obviously Wednesday, you got uh, UNC Wilmington coming in. White out. What kind of di uh, difficulties do they pose as far as matchups? Yeah, first of all, it's their rival, right? UNC Wilmington and Charleston been in the CA together for a long time, and that's what college basketball is about. Whether it's Xavier and Cincinnati, which is you know whether it's Michigan, Ohio State, whether it's USC, UCLA, you know Duke, Carolina, you name it. And I'm not saying UNC Wilmington and Charleston on the national landscape is big, but in this city, on this campus, in their city, on their campus, it's a big deal. We played there a couple months ago or whatever it was, th four weeks ago, and we had the number one winning streak in the country. They had the number two. We got off the bus, and there were thousands and thousands of students giving us this warm, nice, uh, cuddly welcome. Not so much. Place was absolutely electric, and it was a great college at basketball atmosphere. It's going to be the same thing tonight. Um, Takeo is a great coach. Uh, they play hard. They have an it. They have a system. They have a DNA, um, and, and it's going to be a dogfight. It's going to be a street fight, and, and we're excited about the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, have you thought about – I know he's a little controversial. Have you thought about doing the Patino all-white suit? I know you like the athletic gear. That's kind of the way we move, but just for one game. you thought about the all-white communion suit? You're a Catholic guy like myself. I, I, 
I can't, Cathaholic. I can't, um, I haven't given that one thought, but I love the idea. I don't know if I can pull off a white suit. If there's anywhere to find a white suit in America in a short notice, it would probably Charleston. You ever walk, you walk down King Street in the, yeah. the, the shopping? Holy crap. I, I might have a little something up my sleeve. I can't promise it, but All right. good thought. Yeah. Anything, you know, anything that, that moves the needle. That's the way I look at it. So what do you think, what, what's your deal? What's your thought on uh real quick suits? No suits. I was absolutely NBA went away from suits. Are you a suit guy? No suit guy. I'm absolutely in love with the no suits. Yeah. I think it's, I don't understand how it took so long to get to this. I do think the guys who go with the blazers and the slacks, like that's a great look too. That's pretty comfortable. You take that off, but like, I mean, what are we doing? You're running up and down the sideline anyway. Like, what you need to be in a suit? It's crazy. Yeah, I'm cool. I, I I was a big suit guy when suits were the thing. That was kind of my deal. I don't golf. I don't spend a lot of money on other things, but I liked my suits. But after you're able to coach in a polo and and and, and some sweats or whatever, I, I'm I'm a big oh, uh, I'm a big no suit guy now. Yeah, it absolutely makes the most sense. So uh, I'll get you out of here on this. You touched on Skip Prosser. Obviously, you were at Wake. You were at Wake when Chris Paul was there. The first time I ever got introduced to Chris Paul was uh, through a television set. I haven't had the chance to meet him. But uh, it was that story with his grandfather. Yeah. I think it was an outside the lines. If people are unfamiliar, it's a long way back now. His grandfather gets murdered. He goes and scores, I believe, 61 to honor his age. And he does it on an N1, gets to the line, and just throws the free throw down to the baseline. So Guys now, like Chris Paul is is now like in its own stratosphere. He's on the commercials. You know, it's All-Star Weekend. He's a superstar. Like, what was different about Chris back then? Or the guy now, like, it's so far removed. What was going on then, you know, as a kid? Or what you saw from a kid dedicated, his bond with his family? Because I think that stuff gets so – it's so far away that we, like, forget about it. You can't really tell. And now you just hear – you know, the stories, oh, he works hard, he does this. But, like, as a 17-year-old vulnerable kid at Wake Forest, what was his real impact there? Or what kind of guy – what was his makeup? Yeah, man. Like, uh, I, I tell people all the time – this is cliche as well, but people that have a twinkle in their eye, right? People use the term it. Somebody has it. From the time I met Chris for the first time, you just sense when you met him there was something special about him. Um, you know, I, what struck me when I first met him, you know, is, is, is his recruiting profile and, and his, all that started to boost is just how humble he was. He, I, I never forget. He used to leave workouts cause he lived in Winston-Salem and one day he was running out the door and I'm like, Chris, where are you going? He goes, I, I, I gotta go cut the grass. Right. <laughs> so, uh, but just, just that you just sense when you met him, there was something special about him. And, um, to be able to be around him for two years as a player and as a person it was was extraordinary. I say all the time, you know, Beethoven or whoever it is, Mozart, they're 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 just born as prodigies. And Chris Paul was born with a basketball mind that may never be matched. He's smarter than any coach that he'll ever ever play for. He sees things and saw things before they happen, maybe two or three, two or three, you know, seconds in advance. Just a just an absolute genius master mastermind, um, and and yeah, that story was extraordinary. I, I never forgot when it happened, and just how devastated he was. He was signed with us. We knew he was coming, so I just remember you know Coach Prosser went to his house to see him, and you know he was thinking about I think possibly not even playing the rest of his senior year, and then without telling anybody, but I think one of his relatives what he was going to do. Think of that. When you talk about yeah. an it, a twinkle in your eye, to call your shot, to call your shot, Babe Ruth, you know, point to the home run fence and hit it. And then to say, I'm not going to score 48. I'm not going to score 60. I'm going to score 61. And to score it on an and one, airball it on, on purpose and walk off the floor and fall into his dad's arms is his storybook. Obviously a tragic, tragic event, but just indicative of, of of what makes Chris Paul so special. And uh, and that was a great one. Do you think he gets into coaching? I know it's hard to predict with a lot of these guys. And, you know, if, if, after tra doing Minnesota to Cleveland on a Tuesday and Thursday night for 20 years he'd been playing, you think, like, he just wants to give that up? Or do you think he does well, get into coaching? Well, I think it goes back to what I said when I met him and you felt how special his aura, it, it just the vibe around him was. I remember telling people, 
you know, as he was at Wake a little bit longer, whatever that kid wants to do, he can do. And obviously now he's got all this money and he, yes, that affords you the opportunity to do whatever you want to do. But even back then I said, if this kid wanted to go into politics, he could be the governor of North Carolina. If he was going to go into business, he could be a billionaire. So I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Obviously, I think if he did it, he'd be elite at it. If he went into business, he's going to be a billionaire, which maybe he already is. Um, but I, I think sometimes when guys like that are so brilliant and so smart from a basketball standpoint, I guess my concern would be how he would deal with people and players that that aren't at that level, yeah. you know? Uh, but yeah, whatever he wants to do, he do. I think he'd be a Hall of Fame coach if that's what he decided he wanted to do. For sure. So, uh, Coach, obviously, good luck Wednesday against UNC Wilmington. Um, I really enjoyed watching your team play, uh, especially in person. I saw that tenacity. I'll be rooting for you as you make this run all the way through. So, really excited. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me, and uh, and go Cougs. Our city. Thanks.